Um, uh, my name is Dave. I'm one of the ministers here, and uh, it's great to be with you. My, my job this morning is to, is to uh, share a little something of what we believe as Christians, and to do that from, from the Bible. If you, are, if you are a regular here, it is great to see your face. I love it. If, you are a, uh, if you're a visitor here this morning, it's great to, great to see you as well. Um, whether you are uh, someone who's been a Christian for a while or whether you're someone who is not and is, and, and is trying, to, trying to explore and trying to, trying to understand some of this. Maybe someone's brought you along. It is great to, great to be able to share with you uh, some, of, some of what I believe uh, God would want to say to us this morning. So, uh, where are we going to start? Um, this morning, the, the, the title of what I want to say is simply New Life. I believe that God wants to give everybody a new life. But before I come to that, I want to ask a question. Have you ever tried, in one way or another, to to reinvent or or revitalize or or, or change who you are? Have you ever tried to transform who you are? Janine was sharing a little bit more about how the the transformation she goes through in different aspects of her wardrobe uh, uh, earlier on. Have you ever tried to, try, tried to make a shift in who you are? It could be in your dress sense, in your style. It could be in your, in your health or your fitness. You could have tried to lose some weight. You could have tried to uh, become more healthy, become more fit, be able to do uh, more stuff with your body. It could be your home. It could be that you've tried to, tried to um, declutter your life and, uh, and, and, and revitalize your home and, and live in a more, more, more whatever environment. What for you is a time when you've tried to bring about a change in your life? Something, something that you've wanted to change, something that you've wanted to fix, something that you've wanted to shift. We all every so often have a moment of going, you know what, enough's enough, I'm drawing a line under the sand and this year's going to be different. We do it every year with our New Year's resolutions. When was the last time you tried to reinvent yourself and how did it go? Because often... We can start off with great intentions because we think, yep, I'm going to do this. I'm going to sort this, going to get it, going to get it, sort it, I'm going to smash it, and I'm going to be different from now on. And then, a little bit later on, it kind of doesn't, doesn't work anymore because actually the same things that always stopped us living that way beforehand still stop us. The same reason that I never used to put my trainers on and go for a run in the morning, that I'm a lazy man, guess what? Just because I've decided I want to get fit doesn't stop me being a lazy man. I'm still the same person inside, and so those things that I try to change on the, in, on the outside don't happen. Something, something's got to shift inwardly in order for us, to, for us to do that. Otherwise, we'll try for a little bit and then give up. Most of the times when we successfully actually manage to make a change in our life, it's because we've realized the importance of it, and something has really grabbed us or convicted us, something's changed us. Maybe actually the reason that we've managed to get healthy or fitter is because of a health scare, because of something where we've gone, actually, I need to take this seriously. There's there's, there's something serious about this. Or I want to lose weight because there's that pair of jeans or that dress that I want to wear for a wedding. I'm talking about someone else, not me wearing a dress to a wedding. But there's that dress that I really want to wear to this wedding this, this year, and it used to look really nice, and now does not. And so actually there's something that is driving me. There's a goal. There's a purpose. Something comes from the inside and works its way out. Well, in order for those things to change, in order for us to be able to make bigger changes in our lives, not just what we wear or what we eat or how healthy we are, if we want to have a completely new life, I think there's only one place to go, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. So I want to read uh, from uh, the words of one of the earliest followers of Jesus, a man called Paul, who five years after Jesus was uh, killed and rose again and went to be in heaven, uh, was converted, and he himself met the risen Jesus And then he wrote, he traveled and he planted churches and he preached and he wrote various letters to different people. And I want to read from a letter, the second letter he wrote to a group of people called the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. You might have a Bible that you can follow along in. You may not do, that's fine as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. Listen to how much stuff there is about being new. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is 
in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is so much in that passage. Even as I was reading it, I was thinking, my golly gosh, I could talk about this for hours, but it's okay. I know there's the England game to get back to. I'm not going to make you stay here for hours. But there is so much in this passage. I'm not going to be able to do justice to everything within this. But I want to, I want to explore this idea of new life. Paul says right in the middle of it, if anyone is in Christ, in other words, if anyone is a Christian, if anyone has decided to follow Jesus, then there is a new creation. Their old life has gone and a new life has come. It doesn't start there with a new life. It starts with new perspectives. There's really only three things I want to talk about. Having a new perspective, being given a new life, and then having a new purpose. It starts with a new perspective. He starts, doesn't he, by saying, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once actually thought of Jesus from a human point of view, we don't do that anymore. He's saying the way that we think has changed. The way that we, we view the world, the way that we see other people, the way that we see everything is now different. Paul is saying, I think of the world fundamentally differently than I used to because I know Jesus in a way that I never used to know him. And I mean, this, this holds up when you think about the life of Paul. Paul spent those five years between Jesus' death and resurrection and becoming a Christian himself, persecuting Christians chasing Christians down, killing Christians, trying to stop this whole movement. He saw Jesus in from a very human point of view, and he saw him as a threat. He saw him as someone who was, who was leading people astray, and he tried to stamp it down. He fundamentally changed the way he saw Jesus. He fundamentally shifted the way that he thought about Jesus. And as a result, all of this new life and new transformation was able to come. And I want to say to you this morning, whether you're a Christian or not, and particularly maybe if you're not, or if you're exploring, or if you're not sure about the whole thing, I want to say to you this morning that I think, and I believe passionately with all my heart, and I'm sure maybe the person that brought you along does as well, that the way that we can know a massive radical change in our life, that, that brings new life, that brings freedom and purpose and freshness and excitement and, and passion, the way that we find that is by seeing Jesus Christ in a new way. The Jesus who I believe is the Son of God. The Jesus who I believe lived and died 2,000 years ago and was raised from the dead so that everyone who follows him may also have a new life as well. It starts, though, by seeing things in a different way. I remember the first time I got a pair of glasses. I was, I think, eight years old. And I remember stepping out, 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 of, the, uh, out of the optician's surgery place when I when, when I'd got my first pair of glasses stepping out and realizing that trees have twigs and that trees have leaves they're not just an amorphous mass of brown and green they actually have details you can actually see the specific bits that make up the tree I was blown away I'd not seen that before I'd needed glasses for a while I'd never had them and I put them on and suddenly I saw the world in a new and fresh way I believe that when we know Jesus, he gives us the opportunity to see things, not just in a new way, but in a better way, in a perfect way. If he made the world, and I believe he did, he knows what it is to see the world as it really is. So it starts by, being, by having a new perspective. But then we get to the exciting bit. Because Paul, Paul says, yeah, we used to see things differently, now we see Jesus in a new way. And then verse 17, so if anyone is in Christ... If anyone's accepted Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. He promises that for someone who, who commits to Jesus, who believes in Jesus, then everything that is old about them is gone, is dealt with, is done, is in the past. And everything new about them comes in that moment. I'm going to confess something to you, though. As a Christian and looking around at other Christians doesn't always feel that way and it doesn't always look that way 
I know that the day I became a Christian, I didn't suddenly feel completely different and as though my whole life had changed. I still felt like me. I still had the same sense of humor, sadly for many. Still had the same way of looking at a lot of things. I, I didn't suddenly feel totally new. I look around at Christians and I think, well, I'm sure they, like I, also have a bit more work to do, have a bit further to grow. So what does it mean for Paul to say everything old has gone and a new life has come if actually it doesn't feel that way? Well, I think it comes down to this. We might not look like we've got a new life, but we have. The new life that Jesus is talking about is not a, an outside-in life, it's an inside-out life. What do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's go back to the idea of transformation and of, and, and of reinventing ourselves and of, uh, of stuff like that. Janine didn't actually know I was going to talk about this when she prepared uh, what she was doing earlier on with the different outfits and talking about her own wardrobe. I want to address for a moment my wardrobe. Bear with me. There was a period... In, in my life of about four or five months, about three, or th about three years ago, when after preaching, I got far fewer comments about the content or the message or the delivery of what I'd said from here, and far more comments about what I was wearing. The reason was that during that four or five month process, I sort of gradually shifted out from one wardrobe to another. I completely changed the way I dressed. I, 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 I think I dress better now. In fact, I'm pretty sure I do, do dress better now. But people noticed, particularly women, I've got to say, uh, came up and said, very nice shirt, wonderful shoes, Dave, fantastic. Where did you get those? And I thought, I just preached from the Bible. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, I'm, I, I made a conscious choice that I was going to shift the, the way that I dressed because... Frankly, I'd never really given two hoots about the way that I looked before. I'd never really thought about how I dressed, about how I, I just threw on some clothes in the morning. Never really thought about it. Never really cared. I made a choice to start caring. And then gradually, I didn't suddenly go out and burn my whole wardrobe and buy an entire new wardrobe overnight. But gradually, it started to shift. Deborah Jensen is here. She's one of the people who was most ardently in favor of this, uh, this transition in my life. Thank you, Debbie. But here's the thing. Even though I didn't change immediately the way that I dressed, there was a moment that was a decisive moment that meant the way that I would dress would change. So for me, there was a day and a moment and a moment of decision that said, you know what, I'm going to start actually caring about the way I look. I'm going I'm I'm, I'm to start thinking about it. I'm going to start actually thinking that that's an important thing for me to give some headspace to. There was a moment, and because of that moment, the shift wasn't overnight. I still had some questionable outfits over the next couple of months as I was bedding into this new, this, this new me. But gradually over time, a shift took place because of that decisive moment. And you might wonder what it was that caused that decisive moment. You might have questions about that. You might have suggestions about that. Could it be, for those of you who know him, that Jacob Arnold had moved in just a few days earlier uh, or a, a few weeks earlier and I was feeling the pressure to measure up to him? Could be. Could it be that maybe on a, maybe on a more, 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 more godly level, I decided that, um, that I would, if I was trying to tell people about Jesus, if I was trying to be an ambassador for Jesus, then it might, it might look like I you know, hadn't just got out of bed and dressed in the dark every morning. It might, might help that, that I looked like someone you know, in a world where Christianity and where Christian faith is seen as pretty uncool. It doesn't help to have another pastor who dresses pretty uncool, so maybe I should do something about that. That's, that, maybe that's a very generous reason that I could have had. There would be some skeptics, you might say, who, who would suggest that I was trying to catch the eye of a young lady. Um, whatever it was, there was a moment that led to a change that came. And when Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the old has gone and the new has come, what he means is our insides have been changed. There has been a decisive moment and something has happened that makes us new. And as a result of that decisive moment, everything else that follows is going to happen. Everything else that follows doesn't happen in a flash overnight, but it will happen because something has changed. So the question is, what is it that has changed? Look at verse 19 if you're following along. He says, in Christ or in Jesus or through the life of Jesus, God 
was reconciling the world to himself. Think about reconciliation between two parties who are hostile, coming together and being at peace. Because of Jesus, God was bringing that peace between the world and himself, not counting their trespasses or their sins or their wrongdoing against them. So basically, what Paul is saying is that this decisive moment that has happened is that God has stopped judging people for what they've done wrong, has stopped counting it against them, has stopped allowing our failures and our mistakes and the things that we get wrong to be a barrier between us and him. And as a result, the way is open for us to be close to God, for us to know him, for us to have a relationship with him and be reconciled to him, to have complete peace with God, to have a new life, to have a completely new outlook on life comes from having a restored relationship with God. It comes from all the things that were stopping that closeness being dealt with and moved away. But you might say, okay, well, in that case, God doesn't sound very just. He just decides all those things that we've done wrong. They, they don't matter anymore. Actually, people have done things wrong against me and, and they, they do matter. It, it's hurtful. It's offensive. It, it isn't good. People shouldn't just be allowed to get away with it. People don't just get away with it. The last verse I read says, for, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Lots of words in there, quite, quite a complicated sentence structure as well. But basically what he's saying is this, someone who was completely sinless and perfect chose to take on my sin, so that me, someone who is not completely sinless and perfect, could take on that person's perfection. And that person is Jesus. Jesus chooses to take on the punishment and the blame for everything I get wrong, so that I can have his standing, I can have his perfection. I can be who he is because he became who I was. Christians call that grace, this undeserved gift, this unearned mercy and favor and love. For me, and for people who are Christians, this is the heart of the message. The heart of the message is that God loves you enough that even though you get things wrong, and, and be honest with me, you know you do, even though you get stuff wrong, he loves you, he wants a relationship with you, and he was willing to die to make that possible. Hollywood actor Chris Pratt has uh, made a bit of a stir this week. For those of you who aren't familiar with, with him, he's the star of the, uh, the, the new Jurassic Park, Jurassic World franchise. He's the star of the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, so in all the Avengers films, pretty big name. He was in Parks and Recreation. He's, he's done a lot of stuff, and he's won quite a lot of awards, and he's kind of at the top of his game in Hollywood world. And he, this, 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 this week, he won an MTV award, Movie and Television Award in America. And it was one of these sort of general recognition awards, so he knew he was getting it beforehand, and he prepared a speech. He's a Christian. And he gave nine life lessons from Chris Pratt. I'm not going to go through them all, but if you get a chance, go home and Google it. Watch it. There's some, thing, there's some things in there that I maybe wouldn't say in quite the way that he says, so I'm not necessarily endorsing the whole lot. But he is winsome and he's charming and he's funny and he's down to earth and he makes people laugh. But in the middle of giving advice that includes stuff like, if you need to feed a bit of medicine to a dog, put it in some hamburger so that the dog won't know that it's eating medicine and it'll just eat it down. In addition to being down to earth enough to say those things, he also says, God is real, God loves you, God wants the best for you. And he finishes by saying, the final lesson he wanted to impart to the next generation was this. You're not perfect. People are going to tell you that you're perfect. Exactly the way you are. You're not. But there is a higher being. There is a force who knows that. And if you're willing to accept it yourself, then he wants to give you grace. And then Chris Pratt goes on to say, and remember that that grace, like the freedom that we enjoy in this country, was paid for with someone else's blood. This is a Hollywood A-lister choosing to use the platform he's got to tell people, God wants to give you grace, and he was willing to die for you. I'm not a Hollywood A-lister, and I don't have his platform, but that's exactly the message that I want to give you this morning. God loves you. He wants the best for you. He was willing to die for you, to give you a new 
life. And when we have that new life, we also, what comes with it is a new purpose. You'll notice a couple of times when he says that in verse, in verse 18, that God was reconciling all things to himself. He then says, and has given us a ministry of reconciliation. And then look in verse 20. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Once you are someone who has been reconciled, who's been brought in, who's been transformed and given this new life, then part of the, part of the deal, part of the package, part of the joy is that we get to go and share that with other people. He says, I've been reconciled to Christ and through me, God is saying to you, be reconciled. Have that peace with God. Have that new life. Have that transformation. Once we have been transformed, we have the opportunity to transform people. James said that I would talk a little bit about, about this. Some of you will have received an email uh, fr from me if we have your details during the week about this. At the minute, we're th th this is the first Sunday of a month of what we're calling a month of blessing. A month in which we want to recognize that transformed people have the opportunity to transform the places where God has put us. So for those of you who are Christians and, 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 and have experienced the beginning of or, or a lot of that transformation from Jesus, have received that new life, the question is, where are you going to be a transformative presence? Where are you going to take that news? How are you going to pass it on? How are you going to transform the people that you know by introducing them to the same thing that had the power to transform you. For some people who are on a, on a particular uh, program of, 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 of reinventing themselves, whether it's something like Weight Watchers or Slimming World, or whether it's people who, who, who are part of a gym and absolutely love it, people who have, who have subscribed to a certain catalog that gives them home improvement ideas. It's amazing how, how some of those people can be evangelistic about those ideas. This really worked for me. I did it and it worked and look at how much weight I've lost. I'm not talking about myself. Look at how much weight I've lost and, 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 and the, same, the same thing could help you as well. People who've been transformed by something want to pass it on to other people. How much more if the transformation you've received is not just a new wardrobe or, or a slightly freshened up body. If the new life that you've received is your whole being. A relationship with the God who's the creator of the universe. How much more should we be wanting to pass those things on? So we've come up with, actually we didn't come up with it, we've nicked it from somewhere else, but that's fine. A strategy to bless people. You'll see it on the left-hand side of this sheet. So this is the, we, there's some stuff that's going to happen on Sundays. That's good, that's fine. In some ways I'm far more excited about the stuff that's going to happen not on Sundays. When we're out in the real world, when, when, when we're rubbing shoulders with people, when we're having a chance to be that transformative presence. So who are the people that you want to bless? Here's a very simple strategy that you can follow through over the next month. Begin with prayer. Begin by praying for them, by praying that God would bless them. That's the B. Then we come to L, listen to them. Take some time to listen to them, to understand what pressures they're facing, to understand what excites them, to understand what their passions are. Don't go into the conversation wanting to speak. Go into the conversation wanting to listen, to, to understand better who this person is. Once you've done that, have some quality time with them. Eat with them. It can be very easy to skip over this. Eat with them. Invite them for a meal. Go out for a coffee. Take some time to say, you're worth a bit of my time. And I want to invest in you. I want to, I want to take that time with you. Begin by praying for them. Listen to, listen to who they are. Listen to what they need. Eat with them. Take some time with them. If you've done those last two, it won't be hard to find a way to serve them. If you know something that they're facing, you know a struggle that they're having, you know something that, that's big on, their, big on their mind, it won't be hard to find a way to serve someone. See how you can help them and come alongside that. And then, when the opportunity's right, share your story. I'm not saying get your Bible out and whack them over the head with it. I'm saying share your story. Tell your story of what God means to you, what he's done in your life. You may not think that you have an amazing story. You may not think that you have a fantastic testimony. You might think, well, I just kind of grew up in a Christian family and then I decided one day that that was the right thing for me. You might think that that makes your story not worth sharing. Two things on that. One is, for those of you who are parents, I imagine that's the testimony you want for your children. So if you want it for them, why is it not good enough for you? And the second thing is this. That's not the whole of your story. 
The story is that the God of the universe loved you enough to die for you. That's your story. That you were once lost and then you became found. That's your story. That you were blind and now you can see. That's your story. Share it with someone. Who can you bless? How can you be a blessing this month? How can you say yes to God? I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask the band to come up in just a moment. In fact, you can come up, come up now. It would be wonderful. But I'm going to ask, w- would, would you mind here in this room, just bowing your head for a moment and, and closing your eyes, just for a, just for a second? Because I want to give an opportunity for people to, to, to respond to this in some way. But I want to do that in a way that doesn't, you know, put people in the center of attention. So there's no pressure on anyone to respond to this in any way. But I want to give an opportunity in case you do. So if you could bow your head and close your eyes. And I want to ask two questions. The first is this. Well, basically, they're both, do you want to say yes to Jesus? But the first is this. Do you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time? What I've said this morning, is it something that you want to say, "Mm, I think there's something to this, and I want to explore it more? If that's you, could you just indicate it quickly for me by putting your hand up and taking it down again, just so that I can pray for you? Thank you. sometimes just not to let these moments pass us by but the second question is this do you want to say yes to Jesus by being an ambassador for him do you want to say yes to Jesus by taking all of this and saying yes you have given me a new life I want to be more proactive in passing it on I want to be a stronger ambassador for you I don't want to stop with just being transformed I also want to be transforming for others. If that's, if that's something that you want to say yes to this morning, could you just put your hand up and again lower it? Thank you guys. Thank you. Father, I want to pray for every hand that's gone up in here or at home or even just in our hearts for those who didn't want to physically put a hand up. And I want to ask that where we've said yes to you in one way or another, you would honor that and you would meet with us. Father God, thank you for changing my life. Thank you for giving me a new life that no one else could give me. Lord, would you take each one of us and help us sensitively but boldly to pass that on, to help others find you just as someone else helped us to find you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.